Hi all, today we're here to cover Sprint 16 where the goal was end-to-end um, -end publication integration. And here again is Tamsin, consider that's after two o'clock today. So <laughs> Tamsin, <laughs> let's see how much you can give us in yeah. terms of your energy level, but show us what good things were accomplished in the second to the last sprint for this work cycle. I'll show up with the best energy that I can. Um, good, I know you will. I think I think I got it. Um, so I guess since Gabriella, since you've called out that our goal for both the work cycle and really this sprint was to do end-to-end -end publish, I'm just going to start by showing where we are on that. Um, so we, what our hope was for this sprint uh, was to be able to take a collection and uh, push it into an OAI endpoint. We have the OAI endpoint up. Um, I won't I won't bother browsing to it because there's nothing in it uh, for the reason that I'm about to show you. Um, and we have a whole bunch of infrastructure that's been built over the last few months to make it possible for us to publish a collection. Um, I think we have demoed this the existence of this publish collection button once in the past. But for some time, it's been turned off as a as a feature, um, and we turned it back on this sprint. Um, but what we'll see is that if I push it, uh, we get a nice little con confirmation box, and then you'll see that it just sort of stays there uh, as the option to publish the collection, and. Uh, what's happening here is that we've just not yet rolled out the configuration changes to wire everything together and make it so that the objects in this collection push out to the OAI endpoint. Um, I was really hoping that I'd be able to merge the last little bit that makes this possible before we did this demo, um, but that's not the case. So I'm expecting that we'll have that this next sprint. And then uh, there is a lot more work on publishing objects, both through this kind of collection endpoint and also through the workflows, which I'll, I'll say more about in just a bit uh, uh, in this sprint. So I, we're, I think we're really hoping to carry a bunch of work that's like 90 or 95% done over the line in the next, in the next sprint related to this. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I can't demo and end to end publish for you today. Um, what I can demo that's super exciting is that we are now generating our metadata from the configuration. Um, I think I showed last time this uh, these fields. Let's. Uh, And you can see there's a lot of stuff down here. There's not any like validation or 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 related things uh, happening here. The cardinality of these fields is configurable, um, but not a lot more. Uh, 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 Gabriella, you were asking about validation when we were talking before, and you can see. So if you look, describe your work as checked off here. Uh, if I empty that, then it won't be because title is required. Um, but that's the level of, conf of configuration for the form that we're bringing to the table right now. Um, let me go ahead and make this public because that's always fun to do. Um, and you can see we got this metadata here. If I go back to edit, uh, I can add further stuff here. That's uh, funny, Tamsin. <laughs> the physical description, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so what we're what we're doing is is whatever the metadata that is that's configured for the individual deployment, um, which means also for the individual campus. Uh, that's the main 
reason why we change what what metadata is deployed is camp, campus to campus. Um, uh, both the form and the display, also the search indexing and so on is triggered off of that configuration. Um, so there's work happening now to uh, finalize the UCSD side metadata. Um, there's separate work to happen for the UCSD side. And then uh, also conversations happening about uh, metadata schema specific for the geospatial data. Um, the way that the schemas get applied is kind of dynamic. So, so it's possible to have multiple different schemas applied to the same object. Um, but, but it's it, it, the the feature set for configurable metadata is coming along really well for for what we uh, scoped out for MVP. So that's super great. Samson, uh, can I uh, interrupt yeah, you real quick? Please do. Um, you know the process C note you have at the top, the green box. How uh, helpful is, is is on the top, right there? Exactly. Uh, this one, yeah. I mean, is that necessary? How useful is it for me to know that that was a generic object I created and its ID is five hundred three? I think I think that's a good call out, Gabriella. Why don't we adjust that a little bit? Um, I think that those these kinds of UI uh, call outs are are ones that I do want us to be making actively continually. The more that we're demoing things, the more that that this stuff can be polished. And like, this is just a flash notice for the work that got done. Mm -hmm. um, we could probably like get the title in there or drop the work or just drop the whole notice altogether. In general, you're gonna notice some changes when your when your object updates. So I'm I'm happy to change it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I actually took a note of that, and then yeah. maybe maybe I could get some tickets opened. That's great. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna carry on. Uh, I'll just use this next object for or this this existing object for the next thing that I want to demo, which is. Uh, you, you may recall this workflow process. Um, the workflows also are configurable, um, but the way that we've rolled out the default one now, um, so there's from this initial state after I've deposited an object, there's two things, or there I guess there's three things that I can do. You can see them. Um, I can request a change and I might be like, uh, you need to have a contributor. Contributor. Um, uh, and I can see that comment. Um, and that sort of punts the action back to me, the depositor. I'm both the depositor and the reviewer on this item. Um, so it's, but the notices are coming through. Uh, it's deposited and waiting for approval. Uh, yeah, here we go. Deposited and waiting for approval. And uh, we should probably flip this. Don't you think, Gabriella? Yes, the order. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the the i've asked for a uh i've asked for a change as the approver um so i'm going to go ahead and uh, make that change movement is my example of everything if you're not familiar with movement then i apologize um Okay, so now I've uh, okay, so this is kind of the workflow. Um, and when I approve this object, uh, 
then uh, an arc gets minted. And in the staging site, this arc is being minted from the Easy ID API's test account. That's what 99999FK4 means. Um, but it is going through the real Easy ID API and uh, getting applied to this object. And then um, importantly, uh, if I push this object back through the workflow, I can I can after I've approved it, punt it back for for re uh, for re review. So if I approve it again, then it will be the same arc, um, and we're not overriding that. Um, this uh, arc minting process is really important, um, and it's also I I want to emphasize the re the review and approval workflow process that we've just seen and been through is highly configurable. Um, and what we've done isn't to make a single point in the process where an arc gets minted, but to make a step that can be attached to any any workflow. Uh, it takes some technical work to create a workflow. Um, but a, a given system can have many of them. A given deployment of Comet can have many of them. Um, and this is just the default one where uh, at the approval step, we choose to mint the ARC. We could choose for some uh, projects to mint that ARC immediately upon deposit or for other projects to mint it at a certain point during the workflow that's not near the end. Um, so depending on when individual campuses, uh, individual projects have, have a need to mint a permanent identifier, um, our goal is to be able to, to just sort of like tack that onto the workflow process. Um, so it's always going to be an interface like this one with the notifications and so on. Um, but uh, but it won't be, it won't, it, it's not a fixed spot in Comet where the, where the identifier gets minted. It's a tool for creating processes where, where an identifier gets minted as part of the process. Um, I hope that's clear. Was that, was that a good description of that, Gabriella? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a couple of other smaller things that I do want to demo for us. Um, we ran in, into an interesting problem where uh, we had some validation issues with uh, the batch process. So you could create a CSV that had references to files that didn't exist. Um, and what would happen at that point is that we'd create a bunch of objects for the files that were named in the CSV and then only fail at some point late in the process when it came time to attach those files. Um, so we fixed that now. Um, and if I submit a uh, CSV that has references to files that aren't, aren't in the collection of files in the staging area, then uh, we output a useful error message um, so that that can go back for remediation and we don't create any objects from that batch. Um, we expect that there'll be more batch validation work that we do um, sort of on, on demand as we get a better sense for how, for the kinds of batch processes that that we will really run in practice. Um, but this was a big one because we didn't want it to be the case that a whole batch of objects got created when something simple like a, a mismatch between the files and um, the files named in, in the CSV and the actual files on disk. Like it'd be easy to choose the wrong file location here for the collection that you're that you have and, and have that be a problem. So 
So this was a, a real minimum viable product evaluate or uh, validation for this batch process. Um, okay. And then uh, last but not least, um, we did demo um, this display of, of objects in a collection at some point, um, but we were having a little trouble seeing sub collections. Um, this collection actually genuinely has no sub collections. So let's add one. Uh, and now you can see that test collection two is here. Um, I think it's also possible for me to add this to test collection two. And if I go over there, I can see that they're in each other now, which is kind of fun. Um, there's still no real restriction on the on the nature of the collection memberships. They can be configured how, however. There's no there, there's no assumption of uh, transitive membership, so it's not a paradox that collection one is a member of collection two is a member of collection one. Um, <laughs> uh, but I can now remove these from the collections and. If we go over there, I should see, you can see if the membership is displaying like you would expect. Um, so that's collection nesting uh, working pretty well, I think. Um, so it looks pretty good to me. Um, and I think that's those are the things that we finished this sprint. Uh, our goal for the next sprint is, like I said early on, to be able to show this publish process. Um, we we aim to be able to show that in three different ways. One is uh, that when I deposit an object, uh, when I deposit an object as a part of a collection, that I can push the whole collection to the OAI endpoint um, and make the set harvestable from, from OAI. Um, that's the thing that I demoed not quite working at the beginning. Um, we also have a uh, IIIF image server uh, with a cute cantaloupe logo. Uh, the the cantaloupe image server is is a uh, is a commodity image server pro project that uh, we selected as as at least the starting place for our IIIF image services across Surfliner. Um, but uh, this is uh, this server is running and is wired into uh, staging, and there's a production one wired into production for each campus. Um, so that's a lot of work got done to make that happen. Um, but what we, where we got to this sprint was just far enough to make it so that we uh, treat uh, images that are deposited into Comet as uh, as something that needs to be authenticated for. Um, so there's a request going out uh, to the Comet uh, metadata API to ask, do I have permission to see this image um, before the image server will serve it out to you, the end user? Um, and at the moment, that's that that API is just responding no to everything, um, and we're working on making it respond yes. So, so I I'm I'm really hoping that during the next sprint we'll be able to demo uh, this server in production. And this is, I think it's hard to overstate what a big win this set of services is. What it means is that when you deposit an image to Comet and you create the correct permissions to make it visible to the public that um, that it 
becomes usable by a whole range of, of services. Um, importantly, it becomes usable by uh, by a set of tools that can read the IIIF API. Um, so one of those is called Universal Viewer, which we'll use to show the actual uh, the image in this space here. Um, so you'll get be able to have zoom and pan from here. Um, it's also uh, it, it's also usable by tools like Mirador, which have have features like page turning and annotations, uh, in addition to zoom and pan, and uh, and last but not least, it's the integration point that we anticipate using for common integration to uh, the Spotlight exhibits, the Star Starlight Project Spotlight exhibits platform. Um, so, so that integration to oh, ooh, sorry hiccup, and that integration to IIIF is is a really big one for us that we're hoping to carry over the line. And then the last piece is that we are hoping to be able to show a workflow driven uh, using a, probably a second workflow, not the default one, a workflow driven published to the geodata platform. So that will look like uh, depositing an object or a batch of objects more likely um, selecting, moving them through the batch workflow process and uh, and at a certain point in that process, we'll make them visible in the in the shoreline geodata platform for again, depending on the campus for each campus. Um, so that's what we're hoping to wrap up in the next two weeks. It feels very ambitious, so I'm, uh, going to hedge just a little bit about how much we'll be able to show you, but I'm confident that we'll be able to show at least uh, some of that, and that uh, and that that will uh, that if if we're falling short on a little bit of it, that it will be pretty in a pretty minor way um, that that lets us sort of continue the process of moving towards in just to those platforms uh, in the off cycle. Um, so that was our sprint 16. We have one more sprint in this work cycle. Um, and again, those though that end-to-end -end publishing uh, in those three ways is our main goal. We have some other loose ends that we're trying to tie off. Um, and we're super excited about all the work that's happened this work cycle. I agree. And I'm actually looking forward to the next demo because you're promising a lot of good things. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not over promising, but I'm uh, sure you're not. But I like Actually, to aim high. Well, I, I put the pressure on Tamsin <laughs> by saying you're promising a lot of things. We're looking <laughs> forward to a lot of things. No, I'm looking forward to it. You guys have been awesome and great work as usual. Thanks for walking us through this. Thank you.